The Industry 4.0 way is understanding that your data ecosystem, your information ecosystem, is the foundation of your business. So the unified namespace is that foundation. The next question was, somebody had asked, hey, you know, in the IAOT, the data hub explained, someone said, hey, can we use Kep Server as the data hub? The answer is no, okay? And here, here's why. Um, Kep Server wasn't designed to be a data hub. It's not that Kep Server can't talk to basically everything, it can but it doesn't have a namespace. It doesn't have a namespace that is 100% accessible by other consumers in the ecosystem. So rather than using Kep Server, you would use another platform to be your unified namespace. And for us, it really more and more is looking like it's gonna be uh, a tool called Hybyte, okay? So for those of you who have not heard of Hybyte, um, Hybyte is, um, uh, Tony Payne, who was the former president of Kepware before PTC did the acquisition, he actually stayed on after P PTC acquired. He broke off with a guy named John Harrington and created Highbyte. Highbyte is a tool for creating unified namespaces. Okay, he still has a very good working relationship with PTC. In fact, we were on a we were on the webinar for the new release of the Highbyte software yesterday, and that was a joint effort between Highbyte and PTC. Uh, Highbyte basically gives you it, the, the only thing that the intelligence hub does. It's both edge driven and centralized. So it can be, you know, you can have many instances of the intelligence hub out on the edge. Um, it is designed to create your unified namespace. Take that namespace, uh, create um, and, and publish it to uh, MQTT brokers, access it through OPC UA, you name it. Highbyte is exactly the platform that are the solution we've been looking for as the standalone unified namespace. It is only in the 1.1 release. This is a really, really new platform. I think Tony and, and John, I think Tony and John started at the end of last year. We saw, we got to see it at the beginning of this year. Um, we got to beta test the original release and we're now testing the 1.1 release. Uh, very, very slick software. Uh, it Underneath the hood uh, is, it's, it's Node.js under the hood, that is uh, the, the, the expression language is Node.js. It's very similar to, um, think of it as, I mean, I don't wanna say it's similar to Node-RED, but it, there, there, are some, there are some concepts about it in terms of the workflow that remind me a lot of Node-RED, but on steroids. Like Highbyte is built to be a robust industrial platform. Um, we are, we've actually asked, asked Tony and John to, to come on uh, with Tori, who handles their marketing, to do a um, uh, our podcast. Uh, we're going to be doing some demos of the software. I absolutely love it. It's it's sick. Um, um, I Highbyte does all the things that Kep Server can't do in order to be your data hub. Kep Server is a very powerful node in the ecosystem, but it is not capable of being your single source of truth. Uh, for all producers and consumers of data and information in the organization, which is what you need with the unified namespace. What I would say is go watch the unified namespace video, but in a nutshell, in a nutshell, the fundamental difference between industry 4.0 and industry 3.0 integration. Industry 3.0, it was nothing but a series of discrete connections between software platforms. You know, I mean, I would, I would connect my PLC to my OPC server. I would connect my let me share this. I'd connect my PLC to my OPC server. I'd connect my OPC server to my different pieces of software. I would connect those pieces of software to, you know, MES to ERP. I would connect ERP to other, okay? Um, doing that approach, the industry 3.0 approach is like, you know, think of those app, those software applications as a couch, right? You buy a couch in your house knowing, or a bed, and you know, that you are going to buy, eventually throw that couch away and buy another one, okay? You know you're gonna buy a new bed in 10 years and replace it. Doing it that way, the industry 3.0 way, is like buying a new couch, putting it in your living room and then building a wall on top of it. So that if you remove the couch, the wall comes crashing down, okay? That's the industry 3.0 way, right? The industry 4.0 way is understanding that your data ecosystem, your information ecosystem is the foundation of your business, okay? 
So the unified namespace is that foundation. So instead of the couch being underneath the data, what we do is we move it out here and we just plug it. We plug the couch, the application into the unified namespace. So my unified namespace is in the middle. It's that one, it's that ISA 95 structure for all data and information in my organization, okay? It's that structure. The reason we love MQTT is because we can create that structure report by exception from the outside in, right? We don't have to make discrete connections to make it happen. So I've got all these applications. They're all consuming information, data, creating information and putting that information back into the namespace, sometimes in a brand new place that's unique to that application, okay? A unified namespace means that I can unplug that application. I can put another application in its place that has the same purpose as the previous one did. And I can start consuming and producing back into the exact same place that the previous application used to do it. As opposed to doing these discrete connections from application to application to application. Think of the unified namespace as that big, it's not a data lake. Think of it as the, as the organized structure of all business data that everyone reports and consumes from. One unified namespace. Highbyte was built to be that. Ignition can be that. Factory Studio can be that. Standalone MQTT brokers, excuse me, can be that. Okay. Someone asked, can you use any SCADA software as a data hub in IIoT? The answer is no, you can't use any. You can use, so remember what our standards are for whether this is an IIoT software. It needs to be edge driven, needs to be report by exception, and it needs to be open architecture, right? Not all SCADA system. And what does open architecture mean? Open architecture means is that that software will play nice with basically anything. It'll talk to anything, okay? It, act, it allows you to access all of the data and information it creates externally, and you don't have to use any proprietary communication protocol to do it. I can use a, a database connection. I can use a REST endpoint. I can use OPC UA. I can use MQTT. I can use uh, DMP3, you name it, right? The answer is no, not all SCADA systems will do that. They, they don't, not all SCADA platform um, developers care whether you can access that data. There are companies that care. Inductive automation is one of them. Remember where inductive automation came from. Inductive automation grew out of, you know, we, we owe a huge debt to Steve Heckman and Colby Clegg and Carl Gold and Travis Cox and, and Vanessa, um, Vanessa Garcia, who, all these original people okay. at Inductive Automation who, you know, Steve said, you know, somebody said, hey, man, you shouldn't use foul language all the time. Fuck that. All right. Steve Heckman said, fuck all these other companies who are screwing over manufacturers who won't build the solutions we want. We're going to build it ourselves. We're going to build exactly what it is cu customers need. Steve owned an integrator and he got sick of it. And he said, I'm going to hire a couple of guys out of UC Davis and I'm going to have them write me basically SQL tags. We're going to build our own SCADA system that does all the things that customers need. The reason he did that is because all SCADA systems didn't do what customers need. So the answer to your question is no, not all SCADA systems can do this. If, you know, I think I want to use this video to not rant and rave about the companies that, that are really screwing people over. So I'm not going to drop the names on who you stay away from. You can watch our other videos to find out who those people are. That was good. That was good. And by the way, this video is not sponsored by Highbyte. We just share the information that we use. And, Correct. In uh, fact, no, none of our videos are sponsored by anyone. And in fact, inductive automation, you know, a lot of people will say, hey, you're an inductive automation Kool-Aid drinker or whatever. No, I'm telling you the truth here. You, you'll you find lots of people at inductive automation who will say they don't like me and that I'm rough around the edges because even when inductive automation screws up, I yell at them too. <laughs> yeah. So someone said, please tell me IIoT software, which one you're using now. And yeah. we kind of really just talked about that. Who are the key? Oh, this one's good. Who are the key decision makers you speak with at organizations to green light an IIoT project? Outstanding question. So, uh, so I think I, what I'm going to do is touch on that pol the politic part. Okay. Um, in this answer. So I would say in general, um, there, there are basically two ways that we get introduced to customers. Um, either they, the three ways really, 
either they reach out to us because of our reputation. We reach out to them. Guys like Vaughn and John are looking for people who need our help. Generally, we're targeting the customers that we know if they don't make a change, they're going to be obsolete. So we're generally targeting them. Uh, these are people, people don't like to people don't like to hear that though. <laughs> well, if if they don't like to hear it, then we don't work with them. Um, and Javon will tell you, we just had this call, we just had this discussion yesterday. We um, and I'll talk about it in a second. Or they are referred to us by another client, a vendor, a strategic partner. Okay. Most of the time, the person that we're talking to now is their IIoT guru. Most companies by at this point especially now come July, end of July, 2020, they have all created digital transformation boards. They've all steering committees. They've all created IIoT gurus and they started, and many of them started doing it in March. Okay. So literally they've, the, they're freaking out. There are, you, you, you want to talk about the economic impact of this pandemic. There are, you know, uh, we're, we're at a million small businesses have closed in the United States. That that's by the way is like 13 years of business creation. Um, it takes 13 years to create a million businesses. 13 years of business creation has evaporated since March. Okay, a million businesses have closed. You have manufacturers all over the globe that are going to go under. Okay, all over the globe. You, you we won't see any of the real bad numbers until Q1. So Q1 is when you're going to start seeing the devastating reports. By the way, today. Uh, Reuters just reported this morning that the actual um, economic con GDP contraction for Q2 was 32%. We ran our models that we wrote, so the, which by the way is unprecedented, five times greater than any bigger contract, any any other previous contraction. We, we, we've been running linear regressions to do that analysis and we projected 36%. So that's how close uh, machine learning machine learning came to predicting what the actual contraction was and our numbers were calculated in the beginning of april so we knew that the q2 contraction was going to be we thought it was going to be 36 percent when we ran the machine learning we ran linear regressions and it ended up being 36 it ended up being 36.